The Murder of Roger Ackroyd, Disc 6. Chapter 23 Poirot's Little Reunion. And now, said Caroline, rising, that child is coming upstairs to lie down. Don't you worry, my dear. Monsieur Poirot will do everything he can for you. Be sure of that. I ought to go back to Fernley, said Ursula uncertainly. But Caroline silenced her protests with a firm hand. Nonsense. You're in my hands for the time being. You'll stay here for the present anyway. Eh, Monsieur Poirot? It will be the best plan, agreed the little Belgian. This evening I shall want Mademoiselle, I beg her pardon, Madame, to attend my little reunion. Nine o'clock at my house. It is most necessary that she should be there. Caroline nodded and went with Ursula out of the room. The door shut behind them. Poirot dropped down into a chair again. So far, so good, he said. Things are straightening themselves out. They're getting to look blacker and blacker against Ralph Payton, I observed gloomily. Poirot nodded. Yes, that is so. But it was to be expected, was it not? I looked at him, slightly puzzled by the remark. He was leaning back in the chair, his eyes half closed, the tips of his fingers just touching each other. Suddenly he sighed and shook his head. What is it? I asked. It is that there are moments when a great longing for my friend Hastings comes over me. Uh, that is the friend of whom I spoke to you, the one who resides now in the Argentine. Always, when I have had a big case, he has been by my side. And he has helped me. Oh, yes, often he has helped me. For he has a knack, that one, of stumbling over the truth unawares, without noticing it himself, bien entendu. At times he has said something particularly foolish, and behold, that foolish remark has revealed the truth to me. And then, too, it was his practice to keep a written record of the cases that proved interesting. I gave a slightly embarrassed cough. As far as that goes, I began, and then stopped. Poirot sat upright in his chair, his eyes sparkled. But yes? What is it that you would say? Well, as a matter of fact, I've read some of Captain Hastings' narratives, and I thought, well, why not try my hand at something of the same kind? Seemed a pity not to. <laughs> Unique opportunity, probably the only time I'll be mixed up in anything of this kind. I felt myself getting hotter and hotter and more and more incoherent as I floundered through the above speech. Poirot sprang from his chair. I had a moment's terror that he was going to embrace me, French fashion, but mercifully he refrained. But this is magnificent! You have then written down your impressions of the case as you went along? I nodded. Epatant! cried Poirot. Let me see them. This instant! I was not quite prepared for such a sudden demand. I racked my brains to remember certain details. I hope you won't mind, I stammered. I may have been a little uh, personal now and then. Oh, I comprehend perfectly. You have referred to me as comic, as perhaps ridiculous now and then. It matters not at all. Hastings, he also was not always polite. Me, I have the mind above such trivialities. Still somewhat doubtful. I rummaged in the drawers of my desk and produced an untidy pile of manuscript which I handed over to him. With an eye on possible publication in the future, I had divided the work into chapters, and the night before I had brought it up to date with an account of Miss Russell's visit. Poirot had therefore twenty chapters. I left him with them. I was obliged to go out on a case some distance away, and it was past eight o'clock when I got back to be greeted with a plate of hot dinner on a tray, and the announcement that Poirot and my sister had supped together at half-past seven, and that the former had then gone to my workshop to finish his reading of the manuscript. "'I hope, James,' said my sister, "'that you've been careful in what you say about me in it.' My jaw dropped. I had not been careful at all. Not that it matters very much, said Caroline, reading my expression correctly. Monsieur Poirot will know what to think. He understands me much better than you do. I went into the workshop. Poirot was sitting by the window. The manuscript lay neatly piled on a chair beside him. He laid his hand on it and spoke. Eh bien, he said, I congratulate you. On your modesty. Oh, I said, rather taken aback. And on your reticence, he added. I said, oh. Again. Not so did Hastings write, continued my friend. On every page, many, many times, was the word I, what he thought, what he did. But you, you have kept your personality in the background. 
Only once or twice does it obtrude, in scenes of home life, shall we say. I blushed a little before the twinkle of his eye. Uh, what do you really think of the stuff? I asked nervously. You want my candid opinion? Yes. Poirot laid his jesting manner aside. A very meticulous and accurate account, he said kindly. You have recorded all the facts faithfully and exactly, though you have shown yourself becomingly reticent as to your own share in them. And it has helped you? Yes. I may say that it has helped me considerably. Come, we must go over to my house and set the stage for my little performance. Caroline was in the hall. I think she hoped that she might be invited to accompany us. Poirot dealt with the situation tactfully. I should much like to have had you present, mademoiselle, he said regretfully, but at this juncture it would not be wise. See you. All these people tonight are suspects. Amongst them I shall find the person who killed Mr. Ackroyd. You really believe that? I said incredulously. I see that you do not, said Poirot dryly. Not yet do you appreciate Hercule Poirot at his true worth. At that minute, Ursula came down the staircase. You are ready, my child, said Poirot. That is good. We will go to my house together. Mademoiselle Caroline, believe me, I do everything possible to render you service. Good evening. We went off, leaving Caroline rather like a dog who has been refused a walk, standing on the front doorstep, gazing after us. The sitting room at the Larches had been got ready. On the table were various syrups and glasses, also a plate of biscuits. Several chairs had been brought in from the other room. Poirot ran to and fro, rearranging things, pulling out a chair here, altering the position of a lamp there, occasionally stooping to straighten one of the mats that covered the floor. He was specially fussing over the lighting. The lamps were arranged in such a way as to throw a clear light on the side of the room where the chairs were grouped, at the same time leaving the other end of the room, where I presumed Poirot himself would sit, in a dim twilight. Ursula and I watched him. Presently a bell was heard. "'They arrive,' said Poirot. "'Good. All is in readiness.' The door opened, and the party from Fernley filed in. Poirot went forward and greeted Mrs. Ackroyd and Flora. "'It is most good of you to come,' he said. "'And Major Blunt and Mr. Raymond.' The secretary was debonair as ever. "'What's the great idea?' he said, laughing. "'Some scientific machine? Do we have bands round our wrists which register guilty heartbeats? There is such an invention, isn't there?' "'I have read of it, yes,' admitted Poirot. "'But me, I am old-fashioned.' I use the old methods. I work only with the little grey cells. Now, let us begin. But first, I have an announcement to make to you all. He took Ursula's hand and drew her forward. This lady is Mrs. Ralph Payton. She was married to Captain Payton last March. A little shriek burst from Mrs. Ackroyd. Ralph? Married? Last March? "'But it's absurd! How could he be?' She stared at Ursula, as though she had never seen her before. "'Married to Bourne? she said. "'Really, Monsieur Poirot, I don't believe you.' Ursula flushed and began to speak, but Flora forestalled her. Going quickly to the other girl's side, she passed her hand through her arm. "'You must not mind our being surprised,' she said. "'You see, we had no idea of such a thing. "'You and Ralph have kept your secret very well. "'I am... "'Very glad about it. "'You're very kind, Miss Ackroyd, said Ursula in a low voice, "'and you have every right to be exceedingly angry. "'Ralph behaved very badly, especially to you. "'You needn't worry about that,' said Flora, "'giving her arm a consoling little pat. "'Ralph was in a corner and took the only way out. "'I should probably have done the same in his place. "'I do think he might have trusted me with the secret, though. "'I wouldn't have let him down.' Poirot rapped gently on a table and cleared his throat significantly. "'The board meeting's going to begin,' said Flora. "'Monsieur Poirot hints that we mustn't talk. "'But just tell me one thing. "'Where is Ralph? "'You must know if anyone does.' "'But I don't!' cried Ursula, almost in a wail. "'That's just it. I, I don't!' "'Isn't he detained at Liverpool?' asked Raymond. "'It said so in the paper.' He is not at Liverpool, 
said Poirot shortly. In fact, I remarked, no one knows where he is. Except Hercule Poirot, eh? said Raymond. Poirot replied seriously to the other's banter, Me, I know everything. Remember that. Geoffrey Raymond lifted his eyebrows. Everything? he whistled. Whew! That's a tall order. Do you mean to say you can really guess where Ralph Payton is hiding? I asked incredulously. You call it guessing. I call it knowing, my friend. In Cranchester? I hazarded. No, replied Poirot gravely. Not in Cranchester. He said no more, but at a gesture from him the assembled party took their seats. As they did so, the door opened once more, and two other people came in and sat down near the door. They were Parker and the housekeeper. "'The number is complete,' said Poirot. "'Everyone is here.' There was a ring of satisfaction in his tone, and with the sound of it I saw a ripple of something like uneasiness pass over all those faces grouped at the other end of the room. There was a suggestion in all this as of a trap, a trap that had closed. Poirot read from a list in an important manner. Mrs. Ackroyd, Miss Flora Ackroyd, Major Blunt, Mr. Geoffrey Raymond, Mrs. Ralph Payton, John Parker, Elizabeth Russell. He laid the paper down on the table. What's the meaning of all this? began Raymond. The list I have just read, said Poirot, is a list of suspected persons. Every one of you present had the opportunity to kill Mr. Ackroyd. With a cry, Mrs. Ackroyd sprang up, her throat working. I don't like it, she wailed. I don't like it. I, I would much prefer to go home. You cannot go home, madame, said Poirot sternly, until you have heard what I have to say. He paused a moment, then cleared his throat. I will start at the beginning. When Miss Ackroyd asked me to investigate the case, I went up to Fernley Park with the good Dr. Shepherd. I walked with him along the terrace, where I was shown the footprints on the window sill. From there, Inspector Raglan took me along the path which leads to the drive. My eye was caught by a little summer house, and I searched it thoroughly. I found two things, a scrap of starched cambric and an empty goose quill. The scrap of cambric immediately suggested to me a maid's apron. When Inspector Raglan showed me his list of the people in the house, I noticed at once that one of the maids, Ursula Bourne, the parlour maid, had no real alibi. According to her own story, she was in her bedroom from 9.30 until 10. But supposing that instead she was in the summer house, if so, she must have gone there to meet someone. Now, we know from Dr. Shepherd that someone from outside did come to the house that night, the stranger whom he met just by the gate. At first glance, it would seem that our problem was solved, and that the stranger went to the summer house to meet Ursula Bourne. It was fairly certain that he did go to the summer house because of the goose quill. That suggested at once to my mind a taker of drugs, and one who had acquired the habit on the other side of the Atlantic, where sniffing snow is more common than in this country. The man whom Dr. Shepard met had an American accent, which fitted in with that supposition. But I was held up by one point. The times did not fit. Ursula Bourne could certainly not have gone to the summer house before 9.30, whereas the man must have got there by a few minutes past nine. I could, of course, assume that he waited there for half an hour. The only alternative supposition was that there had been two separate meetings in the summer house that night. Eh bien, as soon as I went into that alternative, I found several significant facts. I discovered that Miss Russell, the housekeeper, had visited Dr. Shepherd that morning and had displayed a good deal of interest in cures for victims of the drug habit. Taking that... In conjunction with the goose quill, I assumed that the man in question came to Fernley to meet the housekeeper, and not Ursula Bourne. Who, then, did Ursula Bourne come to the rendezvous to meet? I was not long in doubt. First I found a ring, a wedding ring, with From R, and a date inside it. 
Then I learnt that Ralph Payton had been seen coming up the path which led to the summer house at twenty-five minutes past nine, and I also heard of a certain conversation which had taken place in the wood near the village that very afternoon, a conversation between Ralph Payton and some unknown girl. So I had my facts succeeding each other in a neat and orderly manner. A secret marriage, an engagement announced on the day of the tragedy, the stormy interview in the wood, and the meeting arranged for the summer house that night. Incidentally, this proved to me one thing that both Ralph Payton and Ursula Bourne, or Payton, had the strongest motives for wishing Mr. Ackroyd out of the way. And it also made one other point unexpectedly clear. It could not have been Ralph Payton who was with Mr. Ackroyd in the study at 9.30. So we come to another and most interesting aspect of the crime. Who was it in the room with Mr. Ackroyd at 9.30? Not Ralph Payton, who was in the summer house with his wife. Not Charles Kent, who had already left. Who then? I posed my cleverest, my most audacious question. Was anyone with him? Poirot leaned forward and shot the last words triumphantly at us, drawing back afterwards with the air of one who has made a decided hit. Raymond, however, did not seem impressed and lodged a mild protest. I don't know if you're trying to make me out a liar, Monsieur Poirot, but the matter does not rest on my evidence alone except, perhaps, as to the exact words used. Remember, Major Blunt also heard Mr. Ackroyd talking to someone. He was on the terrace outside and couldn't catch the words clearly, but he distinctly heard the voices. Poirot nodded. I have not forgotten, he said quietly, but Major Blunt was under the impression that it was you to whom Mr. Ackroyd was speaking. For a moment Raymond seemed taken aback. Then he recovered himself. Blunt knows now that he was mistaken, he said. Exactly, agreed the other man. Yet there must have been some reason for his thinking so, mused Poirot. Oh, no. He held up his hand in protest. I know the reason you will give. But it is not enough. We must seek elsewhere. I will put it this way. From the beginning of the case, I have been struck by one thing. The nature of those words which Mr. Raymond overheard. It has been amazing to me that no one has commented on them, has seen anything odd about them. He paused a minute, and then quoted softly, The calls on my purse have been so frequent of late that I fear it is impossible for me to accede to your request. Does nothing strike you as odd about that? I don't think so, said Raymond. He has frequently dictated letters to me using almost exactly those same words. Exactly cried Poirot. That is what I seek to arrive at. Would any man use such a phrase in talking to another? Impossible that that should be part of a real conversation. Now, if he had been dictating a letter... You mean he was reading a letter aloud? said Raymond slowly. Even so, he must have been reading to someone. But why? We have no evidence that there was anyone else in the room. No other voice but Mr. Ackroyd's was heard, remember. Surely a man wouldn't read letters of that type aloud to himself, not unless he was, well, going balmy. You have all forgotten one thing, said Poirot softly. The stranger who called at the house the preceding Wednesday. They all stared at him. But yes, said Poirot, nodding encouragingly, on Wednesday. The young man was not of himself important, but the firm he represented interested me very much. The dictaphone company, gasped Raymond. I see it now. A dictaphone. That's what you think, Poirot nodded. Mr. Ackroyd had promised to invest in a dictaphone, you remember. Me? I had the curiosity to inquire of the company in question. Their reply is that Mr. Ackroyd did purchase a dictaphone from their representative. Why he concealed the matter from you, I do not know. He must have meant to surprise me with it, murmured Raymond. He had quite a childish love of surprising people. Meant to keep it up his sleeve for a day or so, probably was playing with it like a new toy. Yes, it fits in. You're quite right. No one would use quite those words in casual conversation. It explains, too, said Poirot, 
why Major Blunt thought it was you who were in the study. Such scraps as came to him were fragments of dictation, and so his subconscious mind deduced that you were with him. His conscious mind was occupied with something quite different. The white figure he had caught a glimpse of. He fancied it was Miss Aykroyd. Really, of course, it was Ursula Bourne's white apron he saw as she was stealing down to the summer house. Raymond had recovered from his first surprise. All the same, he remarked, this discovery of yours, brilliant though it is, I am quite sure I should never have thought of it, leaves the essential position unchanged. Mr. Aykroyd was alive at nine-thirty, since he was speaking into the dictaphone. It seems clear that the man Charles Kent was really off the premises by then. As to Ralph Payton, he hesitated, glancing at Ursula. Her colour flared up, but she answered steadily enough. Ralph and I parted just before a quarter to ten. He never went near the house. I'm sure of that. He had no intention of doing so. The last thing on earth he wanted was to face his stepfather. He would have funked it badly. It isn't that I doubt your story for a moment, explained Raymond. I've always been quite sure Captain Payton was innocent. But one has to think of a court of law, and the questions that would be asked. He is in a most unfortunate position. But if you were to come forward, Poirot interrupted, that is your advice, yes, that he should come forward? <laughs> Certainly. If you know where he is, I perceive that you do not believe that I do know. And yet, I have told you just now that I know everything. The truth of the telephone call, of the footprints on the window sill, of the hiding place of Ralph Payton. Where is he? said Blunt sharply. Not very far away, said Poirot, smiling. In Cranchester? I asked. Poirot turned towards me. Always you ask me that. The idea of Cranchester. It is with you I need a fix. No, he is not in Cranchester. He is there. He pointed a dramatic forefinger. Everyone's head turned. Ralph Payton was standing in the doorway. Chapter 24 Ralph Payton's Story It was a very uncomfortable minute for me. I hardly took in what happened next, but there were exclamations and cries of surprise. When I was sufficiently master of myself to be able to realise what was going on, Ralph Payton was standing by his wife, her hand in his, and he was smiling across the room at me. Poirot, too, was smiling, and at the same time shaking an eloquent finger at me. Have I not told you at least thirty-six times that it is useless to conceal things from Hercule Poirot? He demanded. That in such a case he finds out? He turned to the others. One day, you remember, we held a little séance about a table, just the six of us. I accused the other five persons present of concealing something from me. Four of them gave up their secret. Dr. Shepard did not give up his, but all along I have had my suspicions. Dr. Shepard went to the three boars that night hoping to find Ralph. He did not find him there. But supposing, I said to myself, that he met him in the street on his way home. Dr. Shepard was a friend of Captain Payton's, and he had come straight from the scene of the crime. He must know that things looked very black against him. Perhaps he knew more than the general public did. I did, I said ruefully. I suppose I might as well make a clean breast of things now. I went to see Ralph that afternoon. At first he refused to take me into his confidence, but later he told me about his marriage and the hole he was in. As soon as the murder was discovered, I realised that once the facts were known, suspicion could not fail to attach to Ralph, or if not to him, to the girl he loved. That night I put the facts plainly before him. The thought of having possibly to give evidence which might incriminate his wife, made him resolve at all costs to... to... I hesitated, and Ralph filled the gap. To do a bunk, he said graphically. You see, Ursula left me to go back to the house. I thought it possible that she might have attempted to have another interview with my stepfather. He had already been very rude to her that afternoon. It occurred to me that he might have so insulted her in such an unforgivable manner that without knowing what she was doing, he stopped. Ursula released her hand from his and stepped back. You thought that, Ralph? You actually thought? 
that I might have done it. Let us get back to the culpable conduct of Dr. Shepherd, said Poirot dryly. Dr. Shepherd consented to do what he could to help him. He was successful in hiding Captain Payton from the police. Where? asked Raymond. In his own house? Ah, no, indeed, said Poirot. You should ask yourself the question that I did. If the good doctor is concealing the young man, what place would he choose? It must necessarily be somewhere near at hand. I think of Cranchester. A hotel? No. Lodgings? Even more emphatically, no. Where, then? Ah, I have it. A nursing home. A home for the mentally unfit. I test my theory. I invent a nephew with mental trouble. I consult Mademoiselle Shepherd as to suitable homes. She gives me the names of two near Cranchester, to which her brother has sent patients. I make inquiries. Yes, at one of them, a patient was brought there by the doctor himself early on Saturday morning. That patient, though known by another name, I had no difficulty in identifying as Captain Payton. After certain necessary formalities, I was allowed to bring him away. He arrived at my house in the early hours of yesterday morning. I looked at him ruefully. Caroline's home office expert, I murmured, and to think I never guessed. You see now why I drew attention to the reticence of your manuscript, murmured Poirot. It was strictly truthful as far as it went, but it did not go very far, eh, huh, my friend? I was too abashed to argue. Dr. Shepherd has been very loyal said Ralph. He has stood by me through thick and thin. He did what he thought was best. I see now, from what Monsieur Poirot has told me, that it was not really the best. I should have come forward and faced the music. You see, in the home, we never saw a newspaper. I knew nothing of what was going on. Dr. Shepherd has been a model of discretion, said Poirot dryly, but me. I discover all the little secrets. It is my business. Now we can have your story of what happened that night, said Raymond impatiently. You know it already, said Ralph. There's very little for me to tell. I left the summer house about 9.45 and tramped about the lanes, trying to make up my mind as to what to do next, what line to take. I'm bound to admit that I've not the shadow of an alibi. But I give you my solemn word that I never went to the study, that I never saw my stepfather, alive or dead. Whatever the world thinks, I'd like all of you to believe me. No alibi, murmured Raymond. That's bad. I believe you, of course. But it's a bad business. It makes things very simple, though, said Poirot, in a cheerful voice. Very simple indeed. We all stared at him. You see what I mean? No? Just this. To save Captain Payton, the real criminal must confess— he beamed round at us all. But yes, I mean what I say. See now. I did not invite Inspector Raglan to be present. That was for a reason. I did not want to tell him all that I knew. At least, I did not want to tell him tonight. He leaned forward, and suddenly his voice and his whole personality changed. He suddenly became dangerous. I, who speak to you, I know the murderer of Mr. Ackroyd is in this room now. It is to the murderer I speak. Tomorrow, the truth goes to Inspector Raglan. You understand? There was a tense silence. Into the midst of it came the old Breton woman with a telegram on a salver. Poirot tore it open. Blunt's voice rose abrupt and resonant. The murderer is amongst us, you say? You know which? Poirot had read the message. He crumpled it up in his hand. I know now. He tapped the crumpled ball of paper. What is that? asked Raymond sharply. A wireless message from a steamer, now on her way to the United States. There was a dead silence. Poirot rose to his feet, bowing. Mesdames et messieurs, this reunion of mine is at an end. Remember, the truth goes to Inspector Raglan in the morning. Chapter 25 The Whole Truth A slight gesture from Poirot enjoined me to stay behind the rest. I obeyed, going over to the fire 
and thoughtfully stirring the big logs on it with the toe of my boot. I was puzzled. For the first time, I was absolutely at sea as to Poirot's meaning. For a moment, I was inclined to think that the scene I had just witnessed was a gigantic piece of bombast, that he had been, what he called, playing the comedy, with a view to making himself interesting and important. But in spite of myself, I was forced to believe in an underlying reality. There had been real menace in his words, a certain indisputable sincerity. But I still believed him to be entirely on the wrong track. When the door shut behind the last of the party, he came over to the fire. "'Well, my friend,' he said quietly, "'and what do you think of it all?' "'I don't know what to think,' I said frankly. "'What was the point? Why not go straight to Inspector Raglan with the truth instead of giving the guilty person this elaborate warning?' Poirot sat down and drew out his case of tiny Russian cigarettes. He smoked for a minute or two in silence. Then, "'Use your little grey cells,' he said. "'There is always a reason behind my actions.' I hesitated for a moment. Then I said slowly, "'The first one that occurs to me is that you yourself do not know who the guilty person is, but that you are sure that he is to be found amongst the people here tonight.' Therefore your words were intended to force a confession from the unknown murderer. Poirot nodded approvingly. A clever idea, but not the truth. I thought perhaps that by making him believe you knew, you might force him out into the open, not necessarily by confession. He might try to silence you, as he formerly silenced Mr. Ackroyd, before you would act tomorrow morning. A trap with myself as the bait. Merci, mon ami but I am not sufficiently heroic for that. Then I fail to understand you. Surely you are running the risk of letting the murderer escape by thus putting him on his guard. Poirot shook his head. He cannot escape, he said gravely. There is only one way out, and that way does not lead to freedom. You really believe that one of those people here tonight committed the murder? I asked incredulously. Yes, my friend. Which one? There was a silence for some minutes. Then Poirot tossed the stump of his cigarette into the grate and began to speak in a quiet, reflective tone. I will take you the way that I have travelled myself. Step by step you shall accompany me and see for yourself that all the facts point indisputably to one person. Now, to begin with, there were two facts and a little discrepancy in time which especially attracted my attention. The first fact was the telephone call. If Ralph Payton were indeed the murderer, the telephone call became meaningless and absurd. Therefore, I said to myself, Ralph Payton is not the murderer. I satisfied myself that the call could not have been sent by anyone in the house, yet I was convinced that it was amongst those present on the fatal evening that I had to look for my criminal. Therefore I concluded that the telephone call must have been sent by an accomplice. I was not quite pleased with that deduction, but I let it stand for the minute. I next examined the motive for the call. That was difficult. I could only get at it by judging its result, which was that the murder was discovered that night instead of, in all probability, the following morning. You agree with that? Yes, I admitted. Yes, as you say, Mr. Ackroyd, having given orders that he was not to be disturbed, nobody would have been likely to go to the study that night. Très bien. The affair matches, does it not? But matters were still obscure. What was the advantage of having the crime discovered that night in preference to the following morning? The only idea I could get hold of was that the murderer knowing the crime was to be discovered at a certain time, could make sure of being present when the door was broken in, or at any rate, immediately afterwards. And now we come to the second fact. The chair, pulled out from the wall. Inspector Raglan dismissed that as of no importance. I, on the contrary, have always regarded it as of supreme importance. In your manuscript, you have drawn a neat little plan of the study, if you had it with you this minute, you would see that the chair, being drawn out in the position indicated by Parker, it would stand in a direct line between the door 
and the window. The window, I said quickly. You too have my first idea. I imagined that the chair was drawn out so that something connected with the window should not be seen by anyone entering through the door, but I soon abandoned that supposition. For though the chair was a grandfather with a high back, it obscured very little of the window. Only the part between the sash and the ground, no mon ami. But remember that just in front of the window there stood a table with books and magazines upon it. Now that table was completely hidden by the drawn-out chair, and immediately I had my first shadowy suspicion of the truth. Supposing that there had been something on that table not intended to be seen, something placed there by the murderer. As yet I had no inkling of what that something might be, but I knew certain very interesting facts about it. For instance, it was something that the murderer had not been able to take away with him at the time he committed the crime. At the same time, it was vital that it should be removed as soon as possible after the crime had been discovered. And so, the telephone message, and the opportunity for the murderer to be on the spot when the body was discovered. Now, four people were on the scene before the police arrived. Yourself, Parker, Major Blunt, and Mr. Raymond. Parker, I eliminated at once, since at whatever time the crime was discovered, he was the one person certain to be on the spot. Also it was he who told me of the pulled-out chair. Parker then was cleared, of the murder, that is. I still thought it possible that he had been blackmailing Mrs. Ferrers. Raymond and Blunt, however, remained under suspicion since if the crime had been discovered in the early hours of the morning, it was quite possible that they might have arrived on the scene too late to prevent the object on the round table being discovered. Now, what was that object? You heard my arguments tonight in reference to the scrap of conversation overheard. As soon as I learned that a representative of a dictaphone company had called, the idea of a dictaphone took root in my mind. You heard what I said in this room not half an hour ago. They all agreed with my theory, but one vital fact seems to have escaped them. Granted that a dictaphone was being used by Mr. Ackroyd that night, why was no dictaphone found? I never thought of that, I said. We know that a dictaphone was supplied to Mr. Ackroyd, but no dictaphone has been found amongst his effects. So, if something was taken from the table, why should not that something be the dictaphone? But there were certain difficulties in the way. The attention of everyone was, of course, focused on the murdered man. I think anyone could have gone to the table unnoticed by the other people in the room. But a dictaphone has a certain bulk. It cannot be slipped casually into a pocket. There must have been a receptacle of some kind capable of holding it. You see where I am arriving? The figure of the murderer is taking shape. A person who was on the scene straight away but who might not have been if the crime had been discovered the following morning. A person carrying a receptacle into which the dictaphone might be fitted. I interrupted. But why remove the dictaphone? What was the point? You are like Mr. Raymond. You take it for granted that what was heard at 9.30 was Mr. Ackroyd's voice speaking into a dictaphone. But consider this useful invention for a little minute. You dictate into it, do you not? And at some later time, a secretary or a typist turns it on, and the voice speaks again. You mean, I gasped. Poirot nodded. Yes, I meant that. At 9.30, Mr. Ackroyd was already dead. It was the dictaphone speaking, not the man. And the murderer switched it on. Then he must have been in the room at that minute. Possibly. But we must not exclude the likelihood of some mechanical device having been applied, something after the nature of a time lock or even of a simple alarm clock. But in that case, we must add two qualifications to our imaginary portrait of the murderer. It must be someone who knew of Mr. Ackroyd's purchase of the dictaphone and also someone with the necessary mechanical knowledge. I had got thus far in my own mind when we came to the footprints on the window ledge. Here, there were three conclusions open to me. One, they might really have been made by Ralph Payton. He had been at Fernley that night, and might have climbed into the study and found his uncle dead there. That was one hypothesis. Two, 
there was the possibility that the footmarks might have been made by someone else who happened to have the same kind of studs in his shoes. But the inmates of the house had shoes sold with crepe rubber, and I declined to believe in the coincidence of someone from outside having the same kind of shoes as Ralph Payton wore. Charles Kent, as we know from the barmaid of the dog and whistle, had on a pair of boots, clean dropping off him. 3. Those prints were made by someone deliberately trying to throw suspicion on Ralph Payton. To test this last conclusion, it was necessary to ascertain certain facts. One pair of Ralph's shoes had been obtained from the three boars by the police. Neither Ralph nor anyone else could have worn them that evening, since they were downstairs being cleaned. According to the police theory, Ralph was wearing another pair of the same kind, and I found out that it was true that he had two pairs. Now, for my theory to be proved correct, it was necessary for the murderer to have worn Ralph's shoes that evening, in which case Ralph must have been wearing yet a third pair of footwear of some kind. I could hardly suppose that he would bring three pairs of shoes all alike. The third pair of footwear were more likely to be boots. I got your sister to make inquiries on this point, laying some stress on the colour in order, I admitted frankly, to obscure the real reason for my asking. You know the result of her investigations. Ralph Payton had had a pair of boots with him. The first question I asked him when he came to my house yesterday morning was what he was wearing on his feet on the fatal night. He replied at once that he had worn boots. He was still wearing them, in fact, having nothing else to put on. So, we get a step further in our description of the murderer, a person who had the opportunity to take these shoes of Ralph Payton's from the three boars that day. He paused and then said, with a slightly raised voice, There is one further point. The murderer must have been a person who had the opportunity to purloin that dagger from the silver table. You might argue that anyone in the house might have done so, but I will recall to you that Flora Ackroyd was very positive that the dagger was not there when she examined the silver table. He paused again. Let us recapitulate. Now that all is clear. A person who was at the Three Boars earlier that day. A person who knew Ackroyd well enough to know that he had purchased a dictaphone a person who was of a mechanical turn of mind, who had the opportunity to take the dagger from the silver table before Miss Flora arrived, who had with him a receptacle suitable for hiding the dictaphone, such as a black bag, and who had the study to himself for a few minutes after the crime was discovered, while Parker was telephoning for the police. In fact, Dr. Shepherd. Chapter 26 And Nothing But the Truth There was a dead silence for a minute and a half. Then I laughed. You're mad, I said. No, said Poirot placidly. I am not mad. It was the little discrepancy in time that first drew my attention to you, right at the beginning. <laughs> discrepancy in time? I queried, puzzled. But yes. You will remember that everyone agreed, you yourself included, that it took five minutes to walk from the lodge to the house, less if you took the shortcut to the terrace. But you left the house at ten minutes to nine, both by your own statement and that of Parker. And yet it was nine o'clock when you passed through the lodge gates. It was a chilly night. Not an evening a man would be inclined to dawdle. Why had you taken ten minutes to do a five minutes walk? All along I realized that we had only your statement for it that the study window was ever fastened. Ackroyd asked if you had done so. He never looked to see. Supposing, then, that the study window was unfastened, would there be time in that ten minutes for you to run round the outside of the house, change your shoes, climb in through the window, kill Ackroyd, and to get to the gate by nine o'clock? I decided against the theory, since, in all probability, a man as nervous as Ackroyd was that night would hear you climbing in, and then there would have been a struggle. But supposing that you killed Ackroyd before you left, as you were standing beside his chair, then you go out of the front door, run round to the summer house, take Ralph Payton's shoes out of the bag you brought up with you that night, slip them on, walk through the mud in them, and leave prints on the window ledge. You climb in, lock the study door on the inside, run back to the summer house, change back into your own shoes, and race down to the gate. 
I went through similar actions the other day when you were with Mrs. Aykroyd. It took ten minutes exactly. Then home, and an alibi, since you had timed the dictaphone for half-past nine. My dear Poirot, I said in a voice that sounded strange and forced to my own ears, you've been brooding over this case too long. What on earth had I to gain by murdering Aykroyd? Safety. It was you who blackmailed Mrs. Ferrers. Who could have had a better knowledge of what killed Mr. Ferrers than the doctor who was attending him? When you spoke to me that first day in the garden, you mentioned a legacy received about a year ago. I have been unable to discover any trace of a legacy. You had to invent some way of accounting for Mrs. Ferrer's twenty thousand pounds. It has not done you much good. You lost most of it in speculation. Then you put the screw on too hard, and Mrs. Ferrer's took a way out that you had not expected. If Aykroyd had learnt the truth, he would have had no mercy on you. You were ruined for ever. And the telephone call? I asked, trying to rally. You have a plausible explanation of that also, I suppose. I will confess to you that it was my greatest stumbling block when I found that a call had actually been put through to you from King's Abbot Station. I at first believed that you had simply invented the story. It was a very clever touch, that. You must have some excuse for arriving at Fernley, finding the body, and so getting the chance to remove the dictaphone on which your alibi depended. I had a very vague notion of how it was worked when I came to see your sister that first day and inquired as to what patients you had seen on Friday morning. I had no thought of Miss Russell in my mind at that time. Her visit was a lucky coincidence, since it distracted your mind from the real object of my questions. I found what I was looking for. Among your patients that morning was the steward of an American liner. Who more suitable than he to be leaving for Liverpool by the train that evening? And afterwards he would be on the high seas, well out of the way. I noted that the Orion sailed on Saturday and having obtained the name of the steward, I sent him a wireless message asking a certain question. This is his reply. You saw me receive just now. He held out the message to me. It ran as follows. Quite correct. Dr. Shepherd asked me to leave a note at a patient's house. I was to ring him up from the station with the reply. The reply was no answer. It was a clever idea, said Poirot. The call was genuine. Your sister saw you take it. But there was only one man's word as to what was actually said. Your own. I yawned. All this, I said, is very interesting, but hardly in the sphere of practical politics. You think not. Remember what I said. The truth goes to Inspector Raglan in the morning. But for the sake of your good sister, I am willing to give you the chance of another way out. There might be, for instance, an overdose of a sleeping draught. You comprehend me? But Captain Ralph Payton must be cleared. Ça dire. I should suggest that you finish that very interesting manuscript of yours, but abandoning your former reticence. You seem to be very prolific of suggestions, I remarked. Are you sure you've quite finished? And now that you remind me of the fact... It is true that there is one more thing. It would be most unwise on your part to attempt to silence me, as you silenced Monsieur Aykroyd. That kind of business does not succeed against Hercule Poirot, you understand? <laughs> My dear Poirot, I said, smiling a little, whatever else I may be, I am not a fool. I rose to my feet. Well, well, I said with a slight yawn, I must be off home. Thank you for a most interesting and instructive evening. Poirot also rose and bowed with his accustomed politeness as I passed out of the room. Chapter 27 Apologia 5 a.m. I am very tired, but I have finished my task. My arm aches from writing. A strange end to my manuscript... I meant it to be published some day as a history of one of Poirot's failures. Odd how things pan out. All along I've had a premonition of disaster. From the moment I saw Ralph Payton and Mrs. Ferrers with their heads together, I thought then that she was confiding in him. As it happened, I was quite wrong there. 
But the idea persisted even after I went into the study with Ackroyd that night, until he told me the truth. Poor old Ackroyd. I'm always glad that I gave him a chance. I urged him to read that letter before it was too late. Or, let me be honest, didn't I subconsciously realize that with a pig-headed chap like him it was my best chance of getting him not to read it? His nervousness that night was interesting, psychologically. He knew danger was close at hand, and yet he never suspected me. The dagger was an afterthought. I'd brought up a very handy little weapon of my own, but when I saw the dagger lying in the silver table, it occurred to me at once how much better it would be to use a weapon that couldn't be traced to me. I suppose I must have meant to murder him all along. As soon as I heard of Mrs. Ferrer's death, I felt convinced that she would have told him everything before she died. When I met him, and he seemed so agitated, I thought that perhaps he knew the truth, but that he couldn't bring himself to believe it, and was going to give me the chance of refuting it. So I went home, and took my precautions. If the trouble were, after all, only something to do with Ralph, well, no harm would have been done. The dictaphone he had given me two days ago to adjust. Something had gone a little wrong with it, and I persuaded him to let me have a go at it, instead of sending it back. I did what I wanted to, and took it up with me in my bag that evening. I'm rather pleased with myself as a writer. What could be neater, for instance, than the following? The letters were brought in at twenty minutes to nine. It was just on ten minutes to nine when I left him, the letter still unread. I hesitated, with my hand on the door-handle, looking back, and wondering if there was anything I had left undone. All true, you see. But suppose I had put a row of stars after the first sentence. Would somebody then have wondered what exactly happened in that blank ten minutes? When I looked round the room from the door, I was quite satisfied. Nothing had been left undone. The dictaphone was on the table by the window, time to go off at nine-thirty. The mechanism of that little device was rather clever, based on the principle of an alarm clock, and the armchair was pulled out so as to hide it from the door. I must admit that it gave me rather a shock to run into Parker just outside the door. I have faithfully recorded that fact. Then later, when the body was discovered and I sent Parker to telephone for the police, what a judicious use of words! I did what little had to be done. It was quite little, just to shove the dictaphone into my bag and push back the chair against the wall in its proper place. I never dreamed that Parker would have noticed that chair. Logically, he ought to have been so agog over the body as to be blind to everything else. But I hadn't reckoned with the trained servant complex. I wish I could have known beforehand that Flora was going to say she'd seen her uncle alive at a quarter to ten. That puzzled me more than I can say. In fact, all through the case... There have been things that puzzled me hopelessly. Everyone seems to have taken a hand. My greatest fear all through has been Caroline. I have fancied she might guess. Curious the way she spoke that day of my strain of weakness. Well, she will never know the truth. There is, as Poirot said, one way out. I can trust him. He and Inspector Raglan will manage it between them. I should not like Caroline to know. She is fond of me. And then, too, she is proud. My death will be a grief to her, but grief passes. When I have finished writing, I shall enclose this whole manuscript in an envelope and address it to Poirot. And then, what shall it be? Veronal? There would be a kind of poetic justice. Not that I take any responsibility for Mrs. Ferrer's death. It was the direct consequence of her own actions. I feel no pity for her. I have no pity for myself, either. So, let it be Veronal. But I wish Hercule Poirot had never retired from work and come here to grow vegetable marrows. You've been listening to The Murder of Roger Ackroyd by Agatha Christie, narrated by Hugh Fraser. <laughs>